um, use the mics so that uh, the transcription and uh, the online participants can follow as well. Um, a very warm welcome from our side. This is actually the third time that um, uh, we are at the IGF thinking about how to bring the voice of the people to this discussion, how to make um, uh, multi-stakeholder governance more informed by democratic values and practices and bring in the voice of the people. Um, this time we're talking about uh, disinformation and disinformation policies in particular. And um, uh, yeah, I'm uh, really looking forward to uh, the discussion. As said, if um, uh, the people want to move to the front, um, uh, we'll definitely spend most of the time thinking about um, the questions regarding uh, bringing in the voice of the people using this deliberative method and of course, um, also on the subject of uh, disinformation and what works and what doesn't work in that area. So um, uh, in terms of flow, um, it's going to be uh, sort of um, uh, you know, us sharing and giving an overview and setting the scene for the discussion point number four, that's uh, where we're going to spend most of the time. We're going to start uh, just with a very brief intro about uh, deliberative polling and um, uh, the benefits that um, we hope and think and try to prove um, uh, it can bring to this um, multi-stakeholder governance model. Then um, we're going to walk through the briefing materials and um, present some first results from a survey that we have done. We're really looking for your feedback and your uh, observations on how to make these things better. Um, and that's really the, the core part of the discussion about the disinformation and the um, method itself. Megan, do you want to um, uh, complement in any shape or form? No, I think we're good so far. All right. Well, um, uh, let's go through. We have um, uh, in invited contributions from a number of um, uh, colleagues um, to add different perspectives to this. Um, we have um, Vidushi Marda from Article 14, 19. right next to me. Article 19. Article 19. <laughs> um, we have John Weizmann, who I have not seen yet, but uh, who will join us in due course. We have um, Titi Akisanami um, uh, from Google and the Berkman Center, um, uh, sitting right um, on the other side, and Antoine Verge. Um, from Mission Publique, a really interesting um, sister or brother operation um, uh, bringing deliberative approaches to um, internet governance as well. Uh, Matthias Kettemann from the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society Research is um, uh, spellbound and bad and uh, has, a, has a bad cold, um, so he cannot be with us. But we do have Dylan Sparks from the Luminate Group, which is part of the um, uh, bigger Omidyar group. Um, Dylan, oh yeah, you're right over there next to Antoine. Um, so let's jump into the, the subject matter. So um, maybe to um, start and, and explain what deliberative polling is in the first place. It's a method that um, is developed in, in variations in various places around the world. We are particularly working with Jim Fishkin and Alice Hsu from uh, Stanford Center for Deliberative Democracy and um, the way it works is that you um, choose a topic and it can really be anything from disinformation to encryption to access to privacy to um, gay marriage or uh, voting rights. And um, you ask people a representative sample, uh, ideally um, uh, poll questions, understand where they stand then um, you invite them to deliberate in small groups amongst each other and uh, ask questions to experts and really understand the trade-off of different, uh, the different options on the table. And then at the end of the day, you give them the same survey again and um, uh, obviously then you have um, various outputs from that. And um, I think maybe most interestingly, but all of them are interesting in their own rights, um, the polling results that you get from the second poll can be considered what people think and want after they have really thought through all the pros and cons. So 
that might be a result that can really inform uh, multi-stakeholder governance um, uh, decisions and uh, discussions in, a, in an interesting way. The second thing is the delta between the poll in the morning and the poll in the afternoon or in the evening, where you can see if there is a lot of movement, probably that topic is not ripe for a bigger uh, democratic de decision because um, uh, people need to understand better um, in order to, to take an, an informed decision. And then thirdly, and maybe, again, most interestingly for, for this community, I think in a fast-moving policy space like internet governance, to have reference materials that are in the public domain and are uh, peer-reviewed and improved over time, that can be a very, very valuable um, uh, resource. Uh, in fact, um, a, a group um, of stakeholders has banded together this year at intgovwiki.org intgovwiki.org to exactly uh, prepare materials like that in a very open um, uh, manner with a media wiki where everybody can um, add views and, and uh, edit it. We have uh, some academic oversight, I would say, um, in that process, but uh, it's really emergent and you're more than welcome to join. Um, I guess on a, on a bit uh, deeper philosophical meta level, um, the, the benefits of this method could be to move the dialogue beyond general consensus statements, which often just paper over differences to confront trade-offs and the pros and cons of specific proposals when you consolidate um, to short statements, and also to clarify where genuine movement is possible, you know, to really find those places where um, you, you can find common ground between different options. So, um, as mentioned, we have been at the IGF twice before. In uh, 2015, we had a full trial um, where we um, had about uh, 300 people take the online survey and then uh, 60 people um, at a day zero event at the IGF to deliberate. It was um, super interesting, a lot of learnings, including how difficult it is in a multi-stakeholder setup like this for government representatives to participate in something like that, where we have now come to the conclusion that we have to ask everybody to participate as a citizen rather than in their stakeholder group. One, one thing that would be uh, interesting to discuss possibly later. Um, in seven out of 13 policy options, um, the um, opinions, the, the um, polls changed really significantly. So uh, that gives you the delta that shows you how much movement there is. And uh, the, the surveys indicated a very strong knowledge gain. So it's uh, not just the deliberation, it's also really the learning that people take home in terms of media literacy and being able to participate in these conversations. And overall, people really enjoyed themselves. It's a, it's a good um, experience, and we'll see that later also in our um, surveys from this time, that people do think they want to be listened to and they have something to say. And I think that's very encouraging, and we, we need to find the right formats to actually make that possible to have an organized conversation. Then um, a year later, in 2016, <laughs> In 2016, interesting things happened, but uh, the clicker doesn't seem to work. <clears throat> yeah. In 2016, we came back and we had um, an even um, uh, or a, a much more difficult subject. To be honest, we, we uh, d debated and deliberated um, how to give access to um, the next billion people and how to improve access in 2015. Um, because we thought, okay, let's start with something that's not super controversial. Um, next time, um, we talked about encryption governance, which is a very controversial question. To what degree states should have the ability to um, ask uh, companies to include back doors? To what degree um, encryption needs to be um, governed and, 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 uh, <coughs> and uh, controlled by governments? Um, really interesting feedback. What we did then was a little bit similar to what we uh, do today. We went through the briefing materials and really got the multi-stakeholders to um, contribute their views and, and help improve the materials, and we made those available 
after the um, session and spread them as a use for um, the community. And with that, I pass it over to Megan, who's going to give us an overview of the balanced briefing materials that we prepared on this information. Um, we can share those after the session, and there um, should be a good number of copies at the tables. So if you want to come to the table uh, and discuss with us, that has the benefit of uh, you having access to the materials. <laughs> it's not necessary, though. We have designed the session in a way that we can have the conversation without you having the materials right in front of you. Yeah. Um, thanks very much. So I'm going to do an overview of these briefing materials, which, um, as Max said, one of the things we'd love to hear from you guys is whether there are things that you think are sort of missing or need to be elaborated more. So the goal of these materials originally was to outline some of the key policy aspects of policies, either proposed or implemented by governments within the EU, and then clearly articul articulate arguments in favor and against. And I want to emphasize a couple aspects of this. These are only government policies. So one huge aspect of disinformation is obviously platform policies, and also there's a whole range of actions that civil society actors might engage with. Um, but the goal of these was to think about government policy specifically, and in part in order to narrow the <laughs> scope a little bit. Um, and why did we choose the EU? So first of all, at the time that we originally started this project, really countries within the EU were the main countries that had explicit proposals on disinformation um, on, that were on the table or passed. Um, now that's not as true. But Europe has still been one of the leaders in actually passing regulation, government regulation, um, in this space. And many of the uh, policies that have been passed around the world have sort of mirrored or drawn on what has been done in the European Union. So again, in part to limit, to narrow the scope, um, we, we focused within Europe. And that is not to say that only European policies are important or only government policies are important, just that that's the scope of these materials. So we focused on disinformation, although you'll see in the briefing materials that we asked some questions about policies that are not explicitly about disinformation, but are sort of related um, and, and have the potential to impact on it. We defined disinformation as the deliberate creation and spread of information to deceive and mislead in order to promote vested interests using the speed, scale, and technologies of the open web. And then you see here, because this is from the materials themselves, as well as related policies about user-generated content. So those are the policies that are within the scope um, here. And maybe just to, to say, um, you know, misinformation, fake news, these are um, all different concepts, and it is important uh, to, to look for the nuance there. That's why um, we'd actually be interested if um, you have feedback on the definition that we chose and or pointers to, to places where we can negotiate what the different concepts mean exactly, because I think that um, makes an enormous difference to be clear what you're talking about. Yeah, you'll see later that, it, that in the presentation we actually talk about it in the, as, as content moderation. Um, so, I, you know, there's a lot of ways in which to sort of think about this framing. So just to give a brief summary, and this is in the materials if you have them, but just to give a little bit of an overview, we sort of divide these policies into three kinds of categories. And that's self-regulatory and whole society approaches, why that's one category. These are, these are approaches that don't attempt to regulate content directly, right? So these are approaches that are about online content, but that aren't directly regulating content itself. So this includes things like the EU self-regulatory codes of practice, and also whole society approaches like those taken in Sweden and Finland, which often don't include explicit regulations about online content, but have a suite of approaches that try to tackle issues related to disinformation um, in the context of increased civic education, increased cooperation across ministries, increased cooperation with the media, and sort of broader societal approaches. The second category of approaches are approaches that attempt to directly regulate online content. So here you might think about laws like Germany's Nets DG law, where it actually is a law that is directing the way that content online is going to be governed. 
Um, and then finally, relatively new proposals like those from the United Kingdom and France, which propose new regulatory regimes entirely, either the creation of entirely new regulators or the adaptation of existing regulators in pretty substantial ways in order to approach um, the, the, the sort of challenges around um, online content. So we sort of outline what those policies look like, and then we pull out a few um, key policies here, um, and we go, th and what you'll see in the next section in the materials, if you're sort of following along, is that what we do is we go through and we evaluate the pros and cons of different policy proposals. And so the things that are included, um, it, those of you who have them in front of you, if you don't have it in front of you, try to share with a neighbor. Um, sorry, we had 70 copies, but <laughs> obviously that wasn't quite enough. Um, so what some of the things that are included there, we think about requirements to, um, and you'll see this in the survey results too, the survey results really go through in detail, but requirements to remove, for platforms to remove certain kinds of content, um, increased funding for civic education and digital literacy, the creation of new regulatory regimes, the concept of a duty of care, which is what's proposed in, as part of the UK's online harms white paper. And we first outline what these are and then go through and try in a balanced way to make arguments in favor and arguments in, uh, in opposition to each, each of these um, potential policy approaches. Um, do you have something else you want to add there? Okay. That's great. Okay, so what we're gonna show you now is some really initial results from a content moderation survey that we did with some with uh, IGF participants. Um, after this event, we will have a, a full deliberative process. Um, but we did an initial, we did the initial survey, and we have those initial results. And now, this is a small sample size, so we're not showing this as a, as a definitive um, outcome of what people think about these issues, but in part to show you what does the survey look like, and there's a couple of sort of interesting things there that we might pull out and talk about in the further discussion. Um, do you want to start by? Sure. Um, <laughs> So, um, the, as said, the number is really um, a, a good representation of the, the international scope. So, we get um, people from all over the world, but 31 is obviously not something that uh, means that the data is quotable. It's more um, as a means to start to discuss uh, what, um, uh, where people are trending, whether the, the questions are the right questions, whether the framing is correct. So. Um, we always um, went with a scale from 1 to 10. 0 to 10. Uh, 0 to 10, sorry. And uh, in this case, we wanted to see um, if people suppose or um, oppose or support um, certain statements. And um, from the first set, we, we thought that um, the point that people have a pretty strong uh, support, 5.7 is not um, you know, inc incredibly strong, but pretty strong to say, um, uh, yes, we want platforms under national law to remove, um, uh, to uh, react to uh, complaints and, um, and do that without a, um, uh, an additional um, law and, um, and court order. Yeah, and just to say this is sort of obviously, for those of you that are familiar, but just to say this is, this is relevant to sort of, this is the German Nets DG kind of model, right? That you remove within 24 hours of receiving a complaint. Um, and what is interesting here that you can see, or is it okay that I go on? Yeah. yeah. What's interesting here that you can see is there have been some newer proposals that have toyed with the idea of legally requiring the removal of hateful content. It's unclear in some of those proposals whether that only includes content that's already illegal under national law or not. Mm -hmm. um, and what we can see here is actually kind of a difference, right? That people in the survey, and I don't think this is super surprising, but it's kind of an interesting thing to think about, were much more supportive of platforms being legally required to remove content that's already illegal than they were of being of of platforms needing to remove hateful content, which we somewhat intentionally did not define in the survey. It, in part because it, this is, partially because it's a survey and it needs to be short, but also I think that it's not super well defined in some of the proposals, and so that's how we sort of proceeded. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a, a term that's been around, but that is, has never been um, uh, defined concretely. So um, that, I guess, is one of the reasons why people 
do not uh, support it as much. Um, <laughs> Uh, same um, uh, set, just um, uh, the, the second half of the, um, uh, those. Um, uh, uh, all national courts should have the right uh, to order that content be removed globally. Now, um, uh, to be honest, I was surprised. Uh, it is a, a, a low, but still uh, a fairly strong, um, uh, uh, or a, f a good amount of people do think that um, there, there is um, merit to that. Um, interesting to hear what um, our contributors and the, the participants more generally think. And then um, uh, there is this new concept um, about um, the duty of care. And uh, Megan, do you want to elaborate on it? Sure. And I'll just say that it is still the case that people more oppose than support the, na the global removal mm -hmm. um, here. So the duty of care, um, we this is actually, this question was quite long in part because we did feel we did need to define duty of care here. So this was on a zero to 10 scale where um, zero means that there is um, an, I can't remember now. Wait, this is why we shouldn't have taken it. It's quite long and so when we did it, no. So zero was that you should, that you had an obligation to take care, mm -hmm. right? And that, and 10 is that um, that you did not have such an obligation, that, I mean, that you didn't, that platforms don't have that kind of obligation. And you can see that people are more, so this is the one where zero is not disagree. It was a slightly different scale, um, but the scale was told to the participants. So here what you can see is people more lean in the direction that platforms do have a duty of care. I think that this, um, I think that this description is, it may contribute to that because we do say that um, the, the second part of this is that they don't have that duty even if it results in mental or physical harm, which I do think is part of what is implied in duty of care. But here's so you can see that that's more in the direction of, of being in favor. And then, um, so I'll pull out just one thing here that I think is really interesting given what we, said before, then this is from the same sample of people, right? Here, when you talk about whether platforms have a responsibility to do something, rather than whether they should be legally required to do something, people are much more in favor of them removing hateful content. Um, illegal content is still slightly higher, but it's interesting to think about the difference between believing a platform has a responsibility to do something and believing that it should be legally required to do it as a regulation. And we do see, I mean, this is quite substantial. So um, on the legal requirement question, people were more uh, opposed than they were in favor. And in the responsibility question here, we see people are more in favor than they are opposed. So we thought that was one, that was, that to me is probably the most interesting single pull out of this small sort of pilot survey results. And one thing that um, uh, we, we should have mentioned when I uh, told about the learnings that we had from earlier um, IGF um, uh, research is that um, we actually targeted the IGF community in particular. Um, meaning that we used the uh, participant lists of um, current and um, earlier sessions. So these are people who um, are part of an internet governance um, uh, community. They have been to IGFs. That's why um, even though we tried to um, write everything uh, accessible to um, normal people of the street, I do think that um, you know, the, the nuance that, that is in questions like the one that um, Megan just reported is not lost on people who are actually thinking and, uh, and considering internet policy in this space. So, um, two more that are more on the, you know, people's mindset and <laughs> how, they, um, understand, how they see themselves and how they are um, participating in an experiment like that. And um, I, I mentioned this earlier, uh, people do really feel that um, they have opinions and that they're um, worth listening to. And um, they, they do feel also that, um, that um, they, they are listened to and that they can make themselves heard, as you can see in the first questions. Um, they, they do think that they're, they're means to participate. I think that's actually, I'd be interested, Antoine, in, in your view. Um, I think that is different from what um, uh, people would say if you went to the more general population. And uh, last but not least, um, this one is um, 
or the two that we wanted to pull out here is that people are actually, uh, or the IGF community is actually willing to um, uh, accept other opinions and they see benefit in um, the exchange. Um, uh, they are looking to f um, find compromise. Um, not um, uh, you know, as strongly as you would hope it to see, but I still would um, believe that if you went out on a, um, uh, if you compared it to the more general uh, population, that that number would be lower. And one thing to note about that is, I think one thing we would expect from the IGF population, and we didn't sort of talk about it th at this at the top, but part of the reason to do this with IGF is to get an informed group to sort of work with what sort of the optimal high information group here. Um, and then compare it to other groups. But I think one thing is th these people in this community may be more firm in their beliefs about these things than people in other communities because they know more as mm -hmm. well. And so that may make it so that you feel less willing to comp compromise because you feel more certain that you're right. Whereas if you, so that may also be a reason why this is, I mean, this is slightly lower than I would have hoped for from IGF folks, I have to say, so. Okay. True. So um, apologies for this long uh, kind of uh, uh, info sharing block in the beginning. We, we really want to spend most of our time, and we still have most of our time, to um, uh, deliberate and get the different perspectives in. Um, if that's okay with everyone, I would um, take note for people who want to come in, if you just give me a signal, and uh, of course our um, in, invited contributors are um, more than welcome to um, uh, contribute as well. If you could please state your name and however you want to um, uh, explain your affiliation. Just one second, I, I, we'll go straight to you, but I just want to say, because we also forgot to say it at the top, we actually have to end 15 minutes earlier than is in the schedule because the Secretary General will be in this room next and they need to come in and do security, so we're going to get kicked out at uh, 12.45, I believe, so just, because we still have 45 minutes, but just so everyone's aware. Maybe a little bit earlier, okay. Oh. <laughs> we're gonna get kicked out when we get kicked out, and until then, we're gonna talk. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I will, I will make it really quick. <laughs> so my, <laughs> my name is Ricardo Campos, I'm Brazilian, and I'm working in Frankfurt uh, as assistant at the law faculty, and I work in, so for two, for one year I worked in a uh, law statute for Brazil, for Brazil, in concer concerning uh, misinformation. And our problem was at that time to see, so should we copy the uh, Netzwerk durch Setzungsgesetz, the uh, legal Netz statute, CG. German legal statute, or should we face another, uh, another uh, problem? And then we see that what we have, what the problem was in Brazil in the last election was uh, the misinformation in industrial scale. So what's not, it was not a kind of individual misinformation, but we saw that was a kind of uh, uh, unlegal industry behind that. Mm -hmm. And then we draw, we design the statue facing this problem. We are, so we make a kind of a compliance system with the platform, for the platforms, and the platforms should inform uh, the accounts that are sending above the average message per day. And with that, we, uh, we hope to, to, tra to, tr uh, to, to track the, this, uh, this in, in industry behind. Uh, and then we have not a problem like in, in Germany that the platforms need to remove content. So, and then we, have, we don't have the problem of freedom of, of expression. Thank so, um, am I understanding correctly, you're um, proposing and working on um, a, an additional solution that you consider more uh, balanced and adequate to yes. tackle the problem so of to, misinformation? To, to make a kind of differentiation between the individual misinformation and the industrial misinformation. Mm -hmm. Because with that, we don't, we, uh, you don't have the problem of uh, uh, freedom of expression and so on. Okay. Th thank you. So I, uh, I guess if people are interested in that um, option, they can um, uh, chat with you later. You also um, changed the subject somewhat to misinformation, I, I want to uh, notice. So uh, let's, let's try to be clear about the differences, and, um, and thank you for that uh, contribution. Um, Wish you wanted to come in next. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
My name is Vidushi. I work with Article 19, um, and most of my focus is usually on platforms and the technical infrastructure that underpins it. Um, so I think the survey had a number of really interesting findings that, for me, are non-intuitive, like both of you mentioned. Um, a couple of things that I was struck by that I think would be interesting to have in the next iteration, if there is one, is talking about the business model that underlies content on a platform. Especially when we're talking about disinformation, I think it's a deliberate attempt, um, according to your own definition. Um, and I think the missing part of the puzzle is that these systems are technically um, made in a way that encourages hateful speech or shocking speech, right? And, and the, the, the difference between saying these these companies should take down content versus the business models need to be changed so that it isn't so easy to manipulate content is two different parts of the puzzle. And I would be interested in seeing, you know, do we have a consensus on the underlying business model or the incentives that come with technical infrastructure that gives us content in a certain way? Thank you, Vidushi. That, that's a really interesting point, and um, it allows me to um, make one observation and share, share with all of you. Um, I, I wear, um, like ma ma many of you, uh, various hats. Um, in my day job, I, I do work for Google and um, discuss these things from one perspective. Today, I'm here as a, um, a neutral researcher moderator of the topic, so I'd love to um, see if Titi wants to um, come back on that particular point, yeah. either directly to generate a little bit of dynamic here on the panel, or um, she had also indicated that she wanted to come in. Titi, do you? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. For those who were not in the room earlier, the name is Titi Akisami. I have a day job as well with Google, but I also wear the heart of a Beckman Klein Fellow um, at the Harvard Law School. Um, and for me, yes, there is a need to actually rethink or reevaluate the new uh, business models that we're beginning to see that enables disinformation. And thank you for catching up on that. It's not misinformation, it's disinformation, which means that there is a deliberate attempt. The whole modus operandi is to ensure that facts become non-facts or they become alternative facts. So the ability to be able to rethink that, I think, is one of the things I want to be able to say that we need to see a bit more. Either new proposals, what are the existing business models, which ways do they need to be adjusted, so to say, to be able to respond to this major threat. On the second level is this, is to take a step back and look at how historically this information has been addressed. Um, from going back to Lenin's time, all the way through to looking at dictatorial spaces where there's been a deliberate attempt either by state or other actors to actually inform people's thoughts to serve their ongoing um, um, positions. Um, on the third level is taking, not, not a step back, but also viewing this from the viewpoint of the end user. Um, I think I would love to be able to see a bit more of that from the end user's point of view. Is this disinformation possible based on political, on the particular, what particular context enables this information even more significantly? Um, and then I'm going to apologize. I will probably need to step out in a bit because I have to be at the African Union meeting. This is the IGF. They expect you to clone yourself and it doesn't <laughs> usually work. Thank you so much, Titi. Anybody else wants to come yeah. in? I do, do have you just on that particular point, because I think it is an interesting one. Is it on the same point? If um, uh, we could um, agree on one um, uh, model, is if you um, raise your fist, I know you want to come in directly on this point. If you raise your finger, I know you want to come in in general, and I'll add you to the list. <laughs> <laughs> so I add you to the list. I add you to the list. I think he's making a fist and a finger. Oh, you're making a fist and a finger? <laughs> That's not fair. And you also, okay, so you definitely go first because you were um, first in the, in the queue. Thank you very much. I am a member of parliament in Ghana, and so I look at this from a policy perspective. Before I became a member of parliament, I was communication specialist to the immediate past president. And so I have worked directly with disinformation in the last elections. And looking at the proposals that you have put out here and the, the, the points that were made by both Titi and the previous speaker, you realize that disinformation is a deliberate attempt. It is systematic. 
The business models of the online platforms support the disinformation because the, the allowance of, of bots to actually do the propagation of disinformation is something that the business models have not done enough to combat. And so you realize that using the solution or the approach of um, self-regulatory code of practice may not necessarily fix the problem. You need to have a combination of a number of approaches. We need to have a conversation with the platforms and say, what, what better self-regulatory frameworks are you going to put in place? But I believe that there needs to be proactive law mm -hmm. that seeks to criminalize actions that are supported. And that's where the UK's new intervention comes into play, where you put a duty of care. Because businesses, regular businesses, have a duty of care to support people who patronize these businesses. The same platforms have to have that same duty of care, where if disinformation, which is deliberate attempt to distort the fact, that is illegal. Mm -hmm. by, any, by any legal jurisprudence, it's illegal. And so they have a duty of care to deal with it and deal with it in a timeless manner. In Africa, we have a challenge where many of these companies may have a presence, but they, they are not fully incorporated in the country where, where the, the operations are happening. And so even trying to get legal jurisprudence to shut down the, the data or the content becomes a challenge. And so I, I was in a previous session where we spoke about the, the jurisprudence, uh, territoriality and, and cross-border cooperation. So I think that we need to have a framework that looks at a multiplicity of approaches and possibly have another survey outside of the IGF confines. It would interest you what your findings would be. Thank you sir, very much. A number of interesting points. I had one immediate reaction and I'm sure Antoine is going to um, come in later and tell us about a survey that is actually, uh, has been happening um, uh, internationally and will happen on a, on a grander scale with normal citizens. I, I, I do think he had a, a finger and a fist, so um, I think he, we, we should allow him to come in. If you could introduce yourself, sure. please. My name is Andrew Bridges. I'm a lawyer in Silicon Valley and I defend platforms and litigation generally when they're interests align with public interests. Um, I'd like to build on a couple of things a couple of people said, but answering some of the questions here that have been posed, I do think that there were significant gaps in the survey because the survey was asking people to comment about other persons and other parties' responsibilities. The survey asked people to comment about government's responsibilities and platform's responsibilities, but not about the respondent's own responsibilities. Hmm. Because, uh, and, and to the last speaker, a duty of care on platforms, then does that mean that somebody who participates by clicking like or share, who participates in the disinformation propagation, has a duty of care and should be thrown in jail for clicking like or share? That may be the, the consequence of imposing a duty of care on the participants because these are online communities that are facilitated by platforms. And so we need to talk about the role of the audience as regenerators and propagators of the information. And then we also talk about content moderation, which is a euphemism. When I post a comment to Facebook, I don't think it's content. I think it's my expression. I think it's my viewpoint. And when somebody moderates it by blocking it, that's not being moderate. I perceive that as censorship. And when we talk about content moderation and don't recognize that that is censorship of expression, it sounds very bland. The last thing I want to uh, point out is the question about should platforms have an obligation to take down illegal content? Easy question to answer. What's not easy is who determines that it's illegal? Do the platforms have a responsibility to censor something because somebody has been accused, not found, to be illegal? Do we require takedowns based on mere accusations? Are we turning platforms into star chambers where their own private rules of adjudication that are outsourced adjudications of the rule of law from governments? Whom do we expect to determine and declare the illegality 
on which the platforms should act. These are major fundamental questions, and my fear with the survey is that it's dealing with our sort of current uh, trending terms without looking at the political, decisional, legal infrastructure that's necessary to be analyzed for a thorough evaluation of this. Thank you. Andrew, thank you so much. Uh, there were a bunch of very, very strong points in there, I think. Um, that said, we struggled immensely with um, cutting this um, topic that really goes to the heart of freedom of expression, of uh, human dignity. I mean, you could go in so many different directions, and um, Megan really did an amazing job, I think, leading the, um, uh, the write-up of this after we had you know, so many different drafts that we're trying to include this and the other, and you want to present something that fits on 12 pages. You know, actually, the, the, um, Jim Fishkin says 10 pages is, is max, right? And we're Take like, that okay, right. this is our best shot so far. Right. Take that as friendly criticism, not condemnation, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Megan, you wanted to come in quickly. Actually, no, you, that's fine, yeah. Okay. So I've, I've seen you, um, uh, the lady uh, um, over here, if you could introduce yourself. So, yes, um, good morning. My name is Charlotte Altenhöhner. I'm with the Council of Europe. And just on this discussion here, uh, I very much agree with uh, points raised. I think that we have to indeed look at the business model and we have to also maybe um, focus our attention not only on the content itself, where we indeed get bugged into, is this now covered by freedom of expression or is it not? But we must look at the sources. And there is an obligation in platforms to, to assess what the sources are. Are these sources that have been known to propagate disinformation and that have already been um, flagged by users as um, having uh, distributed um, fake news, etc. The Council of Europe is working on several verification mechanisms and certification mechanisms for uh, media outlets where a ranking of media outlets in terms of what their credibility is really and what their contribution to quality news sets are. Difficulty, of course, to assess quality, but we all agree that there is some sort of public interest criterion in there, and this is something that... Could you come a little closer well. to the microphone? Thank I think you. that would Sorry, help. Sorry, was there? Yeah. So, focus on the source of misinformation, not only on the content. Thank you. Thank you. Really interesting. Um, I'd love to follow up, actually, if I may, because I do agree this is more of an infrastructure um, improvement, which I think is, is a, a very good um, path to go down. And just because it has come up several times, you can decide which hat I'm wearing. It's, it's really me believing this. I think it's a little bit too easy to say, um, you know, we need another business model because this is about user-generated content in general. And then there are platforms that um, manage to uh, monetize it. There are platforms that are completely open. But this uh, is a question of how do you allow speech online, as Andrew pointed out, earlier. So um, I'm, I'm happy to discuss how business model can evolve and to hear ideas. Um, but I think, you know, just to say, well, um, it, the, the business model supports this kind of um, scandal and, and, you know, excitement and all of that. I think um, uh, in the case of YouTube, that was an, um, a goal to um, maximize watch time. But it's not, like, that's the easy thing to address. You don't maximize for watch time, you maximize for quality. But um, that's not really the business model. That is deeper than the business model. That's the model of engagement and what you want on your platform. And um, I, I think there, there are some, some things coming together here. We, we had a gentleman here on the right. Hello, I'm Gustavo Paiva. I'm here with the Youth IGF Summit. And we produced a few statements which I think are relevant here. I won't read them out loud because our time is very short. But they relate to artificial intelligence and platform transparency. And I think these could be used as points for a next poll. And specifically, I have a few things that might be productive. Those would be, do people approve of using AI to detect and remove content in platforms? AI and algorithms. Should these algorithms be transparent? That is something that people might have an opinion on. Uh, should plat 
is the practice of not removing content but making it less visible. Do people approve it? Because that is less, that is less extreme than the removal, but it, people might still not accept it. And, and yes. Oh, there's a final point. And if there is human oversight to the, to the process of detection and removal, does it make it more acceptable? So these are the points. Um, again, I think there is a lot of uh, knowledge in the room. Uh, great, great perspectives. Thanks for coming in um, from the, the young point of view. You guys are um, really growing up with this while um, you know, we, we still remember the telephone that you had to pick up. So um, uh, thanks, thanks very much and looking forward if that triggered some more debate. Titi, I think you wanted to come in one more time before you have to leave for the yes, African Union meeting. Yes, um, and again, for me it's to step back not step back, but to reiterate the need to be able to look at duty of care as it relates to user-generated content and the concept of freedom of expression. And then to step, to, to reiterate as well that when I say new business models, it's not necessarily speaking to the existing platforms, but the fact that the fine art of disinformation is actually a business model in itself. Hmm. And that's something that we, ha we as yet have not addressed, and I would like to see addressed a bit more. So one, ensuring that we actually break down duty of care from the perspective, I put it as the end user, the person who's actually putting that content out or consuming it, and then also ensuring that that conversation is not happening in isolation, um, to your point around making them respond based on their role as well. Thank you, and apologies, I gotta go. Th thank you so much. Uh, more people have to go to the African thank Union. Coming. Thank you for joining. Interesting point earlier. Um, maybe on... Uh, Excuse me, and can I ask also? Sorry, I don't see where... From the, oh, all the way in the back. Sorry, I um, must have missed you. Please, do come in. If okay, you could thank introduce you. yourself. Alexander Malkevich, the Civic Chamber of Russian Federation. Uh, I think uh, I want to add some words about censorship on the Facebook platform. And I think the most uh, problem is who decide now uh, which is disinformation, which is misinformation, which is a fake news. And I think we, we have to demand... Uh, uh, Facebook, Google, Twitter, to publish uh, their rules. Uh, we have to see the stop lists of uh, words uh, which you cannot use uh, if you want uh, not to be banned. But we cannot find uh, all those words uh, which is uh, forbidden to use. So I think this is the problem. Uh, we have to fight uh, with their censorship because now uh, their moderators uh, decide uh, which is uh, hate speech, which content is harmful, and they uh, uh, ban the way posts of a lot of people with millions of subscribers. Thank you very much. You're um, also adding a cultural dimension, I think, which is you know what uh, what some people. Um, uh, find offensive in, um, in the US might not be offensive in um, Russia or in Europe. So it, it's a very difficult problem. That's why we have such a lively conversation. I see you wanted to come in directly on that point. Please introduce yourself. Uh, Baron Soka, Tech Freedom. A, having a detailed list of all of the things you're not allowed to say is, of course, exactly how one would circumvent the rules in place to prevent disinformation. And it is not, I, I think, uh, coincidental that that comment was just made by a Russian. I'm sorry, but the Russians have engaged in a deliberate attack against the United States and other Western democracies, spreading misinformation. They have made a business out of it. They're doing it at the service of the Kremlin. And of course, they want more transparency into how to make it easier to spread disinformation on platforms. You should consider who that message is coming from and remember that a certain degree of opacity in how content moderation is dealt with online is essential to combating the, the spread of misinformation, especially around elections. Thank you very much for that uh, point <laughs> this of view. Is I do want to point out news. that I am speaking about not the Russians, about, for example, the citizen uh, of the United States uh, called Alex Jones. He was banned everywhere on each platform, and he's not a Kremlin agent. Oh, really? <laughs> so, so maybe I can suggest that there is a component of the transparency conversation that is maybe slightly different. I, I agree with you that a complete list of word that this is not the way to go about it, but perhaps I do think that there is an argument 
that there is a place for transparency, for an increase in the transparency of the process, um, and that that's quite different from increasing the transparency of like the exact mechanisms in a way that makes it gameable. Um, and yeah, but I think, did you, you wanted to say something in relation to this? Well, we're heating up the conversation a bit. I was actually going to suggest that we also go um, a bit more on the deliberative democracy bit, but now it's, I think, uh, a really good conversation and a lot of people want to come in. And uh, if the gentleman um, from Russia is, is okay, to um, uh, be um, uh, a representative of that view, that's fine, but I do want to make sure that uh, it's clear that he's representing himself as far as I understand, and this should not be um, too partialized. That said, um, I see several uh, people who want to come in. Um, if you could introduce yourself first, and then I have you on the list. And I saw um, Vidushi also wanted to come in. Over to you. No, I, I think, sorry, you, yeah. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Masayuki uh, from Japan. Uh, my question is, how did you define or how much did you explain to participants the individual concepts such as illegal or hateful, you know? Because I think those words are quite vague, vague because um, some people consider something hateful, but uh, other people might not, or at least, as much as some do, or um, maybe large, for example, large-scale piracy is seriously illegal, but uh, maybe casual copy is not. Uh, also, I'm, I'm really concerned that uh, there's a danger to label uh, proper journalism as uh, disinformation attempts. So um, I'm not sure how much the participants understand the, the vagueness of those concepts. So um, how can I say? Um, I'm not really convinced that your briefing material is balanced because the participants might be misunderstood some of the concepts. So I really want to know how you make sure the participants understand. Because, you know, devils in, people say devils in details. So how much participants understand those concepts? Thank you. Yeah, so I'll just very quickly respond to this since it's about the materials. To the extent possible, we use the language from the laws themselves that we drew, that we drew things from. Um, and obviously, on the, sur and on the survey, I mean, I'll say again about hateful content, we went back and forth about whether to include a definition of hateful content there, mm -hmm. but when we looked into the laws that have actually used that as a concept, which there's a couple of them, they are not always very clear about the, the meaning. And so in evaluating what people think about them, we were slightly more vague. And maybe that's not the right, the right choice, but um, that was sort of the motivation behind that choice. For other things and in the materials for when the deliberation happens, we tried as much as possible to mirror the language from whatever policy or white paper or whatever it was that we were drawing on to do that. Um, in part because, you know, since this is focused on government regulation and how governments might respond, we were trying to use the language that the governments used. Um, but that may not, I mean, I'm, I'm open to the idea that there should be a different approach than, than the one that we've taken so far. But that was how we did it, practically speaking. Thank you so much. The gentleman with the suit wanted to come in. Thank you. Steve Del Bianco with NetChoice. I think the discussion of business model reformation is not going to be productive if it's conducted at that high level of, of attacking a business model that is merely a two-sided market that we've had since the beginning of radio, newspaper, television, magazines, where one side of the market is to attract audience, and with the audience being there, the second side of the market is to attract advertisers who want to reach that audience. That has been the model since television, radio, broadcast have been around, and it, attacking that model itself as promoting disinformation is probably not going to be productive. What would make more sense is to, to better understand what the business is doing when it's maximizing um, when it's maximizing profits and serving that model. I think Max made the point about whether it's maximizing quality versus maximizing watch time, and neither of those is, is actually what the company does. It's going to maximize its ability to keep the audience engaged, not to have them repelled by content and ads, Oh, and make sure that advertisers feel safe spending their money putting ads on a platform, knowing those ads could be alongside 
blatant disinformation and obscene material. To marry the two sides, a platform will come up with community standards that tries to strike a balance between both sides and adjust that over time. I think if you asked for transparency of algorithms, you'd be really bored. The, the algorithms to determine what shows up next in my feed or the next video on YouTube are based on associations with things that my friends have liked. Um, if I watch this video, the next one I see would be one that others who watch this video also like the following video. So it's about sequencing feeds that are in, designed to keep the audience engaged. But if they succeed in repulsing an audience, the advertisers will go away. So I don't understand the notion of uh, how to reform business models, and I would invite those advocates who believe the business models are broken to give us some more information as to what you desire. Thank you. Thank you. Really interesting point. I, I do think that um, uh, it's, it's right that the uh, quality of, of content and of the engagement uh, determines the, what value you get as, a, um, uh, as an advertiser. So um, the, the, the market incentives, at least, are right. But um, that doesn't mean that the content and the, um, the dynamic um, uh, was problematic um, and needs to evolve. But I'm, uh, I'm with you personally on, um, on the, the, the uh, possibility to evolve rather than to change the business model. Um, Vidushi, you wanted to come in. I'm happy to go after the other. Yeah, okay, Antoine didn't um, come in yet, and um, uh, I've kind of waited for you because I, I think this is to some degree a change of tone because we're uh, talking more about democracy and deliberation and bringing citizens into these debates. Um, uh, so I, I'd suggest we move there for a little bit, but that doesn't mean like let the, um, the, the other topic um, uh, develop in your head and you're welcome to come in later um, on that again. No, sorry, I, no, I used the fist because I know we are going to be kicked out and I wanted to give a perspective on the sister exercise. So indeed what we do, I'm Antoine Verne with Mission Publique and we work on citizen participation since over 20 years and um, since 2018 and until 2020-22, um, we are working on the future of internet. So the question of engaging ordinary citizens on internet governance and the future of internet. This year we have been doing a, a similar approach in five countries of the world uh, with around 300 randomly selected citizens, so in all those countries. And those countries were Germany, Japan, Rwanda, Brazil, and the refugee camp, uh, Rohingya refugee camp at the border between Bangladesh and Myanmar. Um, and we had um, uh, groups of citizens meeting for a full day of discussion and deliberation based on information materials, so the, the same approach. Um, and um, we had three big topics. That, uh, these were digital identity, disinformation, and governance of the internet. So disinformation was one of the topics. Our groups were 50% uh, women, 50% men, so we are happy about that diversity. Also in terms of um, diversity in terms of connectedness, we had 20% of the participants having no internet. Um, and we had, uh, in terms of occupation, very diverse. We had uh, something around 20 uh, farmers and peasants. We had uh, teachers, we had white collar, we had unemployed people, house people, very uh, broad representativity in that uh, sense. Um, the exercise we asked them to do on disinformation was following. We first asked them to reflect on where they get the information and how they rate um, that information. Um, then we asked them to, like to rate their minutes, exposure. Antoine. Yes, no, but look, they rate their exposure to this information and the global exposure. And that's what we had, uh, one of the topics we had before about asking the people how they themselves uh, position themselves in that field. And that was one of our questions um, in relation to how they feel that the global exposure is. That was quite interesting. And then we asked them to work on tools to tackle this information and the model of governance for that. Some results, um, on so on the tools, uh, education came first, and education was also part of me, myself, what I have to do to uh, tackle this information, so the role of the individual. Um, second were tools, so technical tools, algorithms, system downgrading information, that rated second. And third came regulation and self-regulation. So for the people, it was not the priority. Um, but on the other side, when we asked who should take care, 
They had a very strong support for co-decision, so it's more than multi-stakeholder. They really wanted to have a co-decision between all uh, stakeholders. But at the end, when we ask, okay, and if someone would have the last word, who should that be? And states came first, uh, but followed by private companies. So that was an, an interesting answer on governance. And then, um, I can stop here, One but also point. I wanted yeah. to react on something you said, you said, <laughs> and about enjoying, enjoying. And because people go through that process, they have no idea about the topics, they came in, they inform themselves, they discuss with fellow citizens, they go out and they enjoyed it, and this has a transformative role. And I think this is to be applied with citizens, but here at IGF, because this is what happens. You start discussing and get to the common ground, and that's very, very important. That's why we do that, uh, and you too, and I think that's um, the core of it. Thank you. Thank you, Antoine. And um, uh, for those who um, might not know, this IGF has a, another means to bring in the voice of the people. Um, the German government has um, invited parliamentarians from around the world to come here. And for the first time, we have 120 parliamentarians from um, really all, um, all over um, participating in our conversations. And I think that's a, a really, really good thing because um, internet governance is something that um, we, we all uh, experience on, on a daily basis. Vidushi, you wanted to come in. Oh, maybe just, wait, wait. No, for more information and results, we present them on Thursday. Thursday at 4, we have an open forum and we present the results. So if you want to see more of the results, it's Thursday at 4. Thank you. I wanted to pick up on a couple of things uh, that were said in the discussion, and I think we're at the risk of oversimplifying very complicated problems. So the first was around censorship and free speech, which I believe you brought up. I don't think it's anyone's case that free speech is an absolute right. Uh, speech is a right that has reasonable restrictions that are provided by law. It should be necessary, proportionate, have a legitimate um, aim by which you're, uh, for which you're restricting speech. I think the current problem is that when you just have community standards or if you just have a private company uh, determining what is legitimate speech or not, there's no clarity in the process. And a big example of that was when Mark Zuckerberg went before the Senate and he said that any speech that makes other people uncomfortable will be taken down. Uncomfortable speech is legitimate speech. Um, it's protected by freedom of expression law around the world, so I think understanding or rather um, reckoning with the texture that comes with legitimate speech that we may not like but needs to be kept up versus illegitimate speech that needs to be restricted by a procedure that is established by law internationally that is beyond any one border. And the second thing about the business model, uh, just to quickly respond, I think, I don't think that at least, I, I, I don't want to speak for the other speakers who aren't here anymore, but I wasn't saying we need a new business model because that's problematizing without giving any sort of viable solution. And I agree with you, that isn't um, constructive at all. But I think questioning the business model for what it is optimizing, like I think Steve said a little earlier, is crucial. And I think if, we, if we're just gonna say, show us the algorithm, we're not gonna get anything because no human's gonna make sense of it. But understanding these systems as socio-technical systems, to, to understand where that system was designed, who it was designed by, what it's optimizing for, what weights that particular system is taught to respond to is really important. And I, I will end with this example. I think that's what Facebook didn't do in Myanmar, which is what we saw um, happen with the genocide because a system was thought of as a technical system in isolation without considering the nuances that come with the social context. And I think the business model there was to optimize for something uh, in an efficient way when it should have been more deliberate. Um, and we can talk more, I don't want to take up too much time, but I hope that kind of answers your question. Thank you very much. Dylan, you wanted to come in. Please introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Dylan uh, Sparks and I work at Luminate with the Luminate Group. Um, I would just like to go off some of the, the points that Vidushi made, which I uh, completely agree with. Um, I think context is very important uh, with the uh, the different models proposed in the in the briefing materials, I think uh, the the harmful or Ill illegal content model which Germany has adopted uh, is a model which is probably going to be quite specific to this legal system in this country's history. In the same way that the duty of care model in the UK will have a particular appeal because of precedent there, which might not exist in other countries. But I do think it's important to remember that uh, this isn't the first time mass communication uh, platforms have been regulated. 
like starting with the telegram, with newspapers, with uh, what can and cannot be said on like live news or radio. So these things, uh, I think it's important sometimes uh, the internet and digital, everything seems new, but in many ways we have precedent for the types of ways we can make sure that they are productive functions in societies and uh, specifically in democracies. Um, so, but I really thought that the briefing materials, even for people like us who work in this field, um, often it was like a good reminder of the different models and options and the pitfalls with, with each of them. And I think it was just kind of reinforced ideas that many of us had that there's not gonna be a one size fits all and there's probably not gonna be a global solution either, especially with um, legal systems. It's many, much of it is gonna happen case by case. But I think the point that was raised by the MP from Ghana is an important one because I think there are inequities um, with access to platforms. Uh, some states have much more influence um, in trying to push for like political ad transparency. Like if the Ghanaian MPs uh, uh, try to talk to Facebook, obviously it would be a different uh, response to like British or Canadian or American MPs. So I think all of these issues are imp important to, to think about as we move forward. So um, thank you very much. I do want to invite everybody who's interested in the subject matter to uh, check out the intgovwiki.org where the materials will be available to uh, consider and to evolve as a, as a public good, basically. And uh, you know, just to respond very quickly to the, the, um, the point about politicians and, and different legal systems um, having different access to um, the possibility to, to companies, that's why I do think we need an international solution. You know, it cannot be nation by nation and, uh, and to different cultures to different cultures. What, what I think makes much more sense is to consider each online domain a place. And when you go into a, a hip hop club and uh, a certain language is expected, when you go into a classical uh, opera, a certain language is expected. I think we should not, you know, when you are in, um, in Saudi Arabia, it's different than in, um, uh, in London, etc. So I think we, we have to do both. We have to um, accept this plurality and this diversity of place as well as um, uh, an, an international common um, infrastructure to discuss these things. And this has I, provoked some um, uh, reactions. I have you, you, and you, and you I have a very quick too. response and then we'll go, but I just wanted to say really quickly, one thing I want to keep in mind is Nets DG or these laws may be very place specific, but they also get copied. And so thinking about them in isolation, I think risks us missing some of that spillover. And they often get copied in places where the context is quite different and we have to think about that. I do think that all of you want to come in directly on this point. So I um, invite you from the back, you were first to, to come to the front to the microphone so we can hear you. And we have three minutes, I'm being told, so please be very quick. Yeah. <laughs> because we do have a couple other people. Hi, uh, my name is Carmen. I don't represent any organization, but my background is in press. I just want to add a quick comment and then uh, a, a question in the end, uh, more on a working level. I feel like the discussion here is very much high level. And there were points made regarding, you know, for the platforms, how would they have the knowledge slash authority to decide whether content is harmful or illegal. And there's been points made on um, the business models of the platform. And I wanted to bring a very working level point regarding um, what would be the role of press. We are in a multi-stakeholder um, dialogue here. And I know that some platforms are already having news partnerships um, with different journalists and media. The thing is, when it comes to disinformation, information is not a tangible thingy. If you are selling a car... Okay, sorry, but sorry. I do have to ask you because we want to give also the word to right, the other sorry. two speakers. To make it very quick, um, the platform companies are not journalists, which means they can't do the journalistic work of fact-finding fact and fact-checking of videos, which... Do we have the full video of who shot who first, or which are the beginning or the end? So my question is, um, how 
would you consider inviting the role of journalist or press into balancing the work that tech companies just can't do? Or so I think will, um, will that's, that, sorry, that's a or fascinating will, question. Or will that pose another problem to the journalism industry, basically increasing its reliance on platforms? I, I hope not. I hope journalism continues the way it does. So let's go to the other two speakers so we can hear from as many as possible. Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Mai Simon from the American University in Cairo and Freie Universität Berlin. Uh, first, I would like to thank you for all the valuable inputs. And uh, second, my question is, okay, what if the authoritarian regimes or governments use the regulations on the internet to uh, put more oppression or uh, restrictions on the freedom of speech? How can we protect ourselves from this? Very good Thank question. You. Cole Quinn, Microsoft. The inputs are great, and I was just keen to understand what your plans are for the outputs of this study. So, um, as said, it's um, the three impacts that we're seeking to um, uh, get to an understanding what an informed um, uh, community would um, uh, prefer, to see the delta between the before and after, and to have the balanced briefing materials. So far, we have the balanced briefing materials. The next two steps are to come. You're more than welcome. Everybody is more than welcome to come up to us after this session and, um, uh, and collaborate. It's really, uh, uh, I think it takes a village to get this right. And uh, the more people look at the, um, uh, the materials and, and spread the word, uh, the better it is. I, I'm fairly certain that we are going to be kicked out now. And so um, I want to thank all of you for coming and for participating in such a lively discussion. It was great to have all of you here.